Hello everyone. Welcome to our online talk about prehistoric monuments. Um, it's really good to see so many of you. Thank you for all for coming. Sorry about any link troubles that anyone had earlier. Hopefully we got that email out to you in time and you weren't too confused. Um, my name is Ginny and I'm a community archaeologist with Dig Ventures. For those of you who haven't met Dig Ventures before, we're a team of archaeologists who are on a mission to connect people who love archaeology with opportunities to do archaeology online and in the field. So that means you can join a dig in person or you can come to our events just like this one. Tonight I'm joined by three very special guests. First up I've got Kim from Dig Ventures, my fellow colleague and our resident geophysics expert. She's also been running our dig at Carvai Promontory Fort in Wales and she's here tonight to talk a little bit more about that dig, share some of the things that we found and more about the ancient forts all along Pembrokeshire's coastline as well. I'm also joined by Dig Ventures' newest face, John Ski. John Ski is our Chief Digital Officer and he's got a passion for things that beep. But tonight he's here to chat to you all about Bruna Boyne in Ireland. And last but by no means least, we've also got Paul Frodsham as well. So Paul is a community archaeologist with a passion for rock art and he also has a great love for Long Meg, which is a stone circle in Cumbria. And that is going to be the topic of his talk tonight. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly before we get started. I've set myself a little bit of a challenge tonight, so I'll tell you all about it once I get there. But um, we'll see how I do, fingers crossed. And then we'll jump into our main event uh, and get going. So welcome. What are we going to talk about tonight? So to introduce us is myself. I've decided that I'm going to try and contextualize prehistory for you in about 10 minutes, which is it impossible? Yes, probably. Am I going to try? Yes. <laughs> so we'll see how I do. Hopefully I'll give you a bit of an idea for anyone who isn't sure about prehistory, has never encountered prehistory in the British Isles in particular before. Then we're going to hand over to Paul, who's going to talk all about Long Meg and her daughters, the stone circle that's in the Eden Valley in Cumbria, and some of the landscape as well. And then we've got John Ski, who's going to talk to us a bit about Newgrange and Bruna Boyne, as I said, and Kim, who's going to talk about Carvai Camp and the Pembrokeshire coast. And then we're going to round it off with a Q&A at the end. So it's quite the night we've got for you guys. Hopefully we do a good job. I like that I've got Hillary supporting me in the chat, so I'm feeling confident. <laughs> so let's go. Contextualising prehistory. Let's see how we do. Ten minutes. All right. You can time me if you want, but we'll see how we go. So first of all, I thought we'd start by talking about what is prehistory. So archaeologists use this word quite often. We've done it ourselves tonight in the title of this event. And before we tackle prehistoric monuments, I thought we'd start by establishing what that actually means. So in the literal sense, it is before history. History in this case is referring to literary history or written history. So those written records of the human past. Prehistory itself is usually considered to stretch from around 3.3 million years ago, which is when hominins, who are the ancestors of modern humans, first began to use stone tools like flints, all the way through to the invention of writing systems. So, of course, you might be thinking that definition is handy, but it's a little bit wobbly. Absolutely. Um, different societies developed writing systems at different times different technologies spread at varying rates. There's no definitive rule when it comes to defining the dates and periods of prehistory across the world. It's a bit of a mix and match situation depending on where you are and what happened there over history. Um, we do also have proto-history. I'm gonna throw that in now because it's gonna come into play a little bit later in my talk. So this is where we do have written records, which refer to a prehistoric society. So these records have been written by someone who has witnessed this society and proceeded to write about it, not by the society themselves. Um, and just for today, like I said, I'm going to focus on the prehistory of the British Isles with a little bit of continental Europe thrown in for context as well keeping us within that 10 minute time frame. So just keep in mind that it's not easy to define prehistory and this will be a little bit different to your prehistory, maybe if you're joining us from another country, um, but I'll do my best to keep it as logical as I can. So where do we begin? So we're actually gonna start, have I done my slides wrong around? 
no, I've lost the slide. Oh well. So prehistory is split into different ages, but in reality, it's not often so simple. So to keep things brief today, we're going to use these ages. But if you do more research yourself, if you go away and start reading up about it, you might encounter prehistoric research that uses a bit more of detailed chronology. Um, but I'm going to start with the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic. So this is the time of the hunter fisher gatherer. These societies used stone tools and they were quite nomadic, so they didn't particularly settle anywhere. There's a lot of evidence for seasonal movement. And they were also somewhat isolated to so their limited contact with outsiders as well. There were some environmental changes in these periods that were really good for hunter gatherers. Um, population densities increased a bit, mobility declined as we went on, um, but that pretty much is the main characteristics what we're looking at before the Neolithic. Um, so eventually the Neolithic arrives and that basically refers to the spread of farming throughout Europe. So that means domesticated animals and domesticated plants, which you probably guessed that kind of destabilizes that hunter gatherer lifestyle, throws it off its course. The spread of farming seems to flow from the Aegean over to the British Isles, but it wasn't a quick process by any means. It took about two and a half thousand years to make its way over. It did stop and start quite a few times. And it also wasn't necessarily an immediate process. Um, as the Neolithic spread through Europe, uh, Neolithic farming communities and more hunter-gathering Mesolithic communities appear to have lived side by side in some areas as well. So it didn't catch on everywhere straight away. It was quite a complex process. Eventually farming does arrive in Britain in around 400 BC calibrated years after a bit of a delay. Um, society starts to become more settled, but not completely. Um, and there's a rise in trade and communication between communities. We start to see things like pottery and weaving. There are new tool technologies. And of course, as you can see, we start to see monuments, but we'll come back to that later. I'm going to finish on monuments since that's sort of the big topic of our talk tonight. I'm going to move on to the rise of metallurgy. So eventually people started to use metal. Um, they started with copper before transitioning into bronze in around 2200 BC, hence the Bronze Age. With metal, people began to create weapons and jewellery and trade began to increase. Tin began to be traded from Britain to Ireland and to continental Europe and copper began to be mined in Ireland. Ireland also had a really good uh, source of gold. They had lots of gold available to them. And so they crafted ornaments that were traded all the way into continental Europe. We find them around. Uh, we start to see more complex funeral rites as well. There were richer graves. If anyone's heard of beaker pottery or the bell beakers, you might know a bit more. You can read up on them if you're interested as well. But we do start to see these more decorated graves generally. Uh, and during the Bronze Age, society became even more settled. The landscape started to be more divided up. Um, but eventually, uh, bronze was out and iron was in and we moved into the Iron Age. It was the new metal of choice. People began to be using that to create more weapons and tools. Um, coinage began to emerge as well and tribal systems too. And of course, people came into contact with a very famous group of people. You might have heard of them the Romans. Um, someone's mentioned the Romans in the chat, actually. <laughs> um, so when does prehistory end. So while Ireland remained in the Iron Age until around 400 AD because of its lack of contact with the Romans, um, there are some proto-historic records of Ireland during this time. That's like I said earlier, they've been written about Irish peoples, not by them. Um, some argue that there seems to be an evidence of a decline in human settlement and activity in the archaeological record of Ireland at this time, which might be an effect of being neighbours with the Romans. Um, we do know that they like to get around and interfere with things. So. <laughs> um, and speaking of, of course, as you know, Great Britain, the, the island was conquered by the Romans in 43 AD, which ended prehistory for most of them. Um, but of course, like Ireland, unconquered areas of Scotland remained in the Iron Age. Um, past that date. But what I'm going to do now 
is I'm going to link back around to monuments. I think I'm doing pretty good for time here. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we start to see this emergence of monuments around the time of the Neolithic. The earliest monuments were earthwork sites, so usually long barrows, causeway enclosures and cursus monuments. Um, as with many prehistoric monuments, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, there's lots of debate over the function of causeway enclosure and cursus monuments. Um, on the other hand, we do know, thanks to archaeology, that long barrows were used as tombs. We have found evidence of human remains in there, so we know that they're a funerary monument. Um, additionally, though, it is believed by some academics that long barrows also served another purpose, perhaps a religious or a social function. Um, and there's some suggestion too, which I found quite interesting, that the appearance of long barrows actually reflects the design of some of the earlier Neolithic houses. Not proven, just a theory, but I think that's quite interesting. Um, we do have other types of funerary monument, including cairns and other tombs. Ireland's actually a really great place to find megalithic tombs. It's got several different types of tomb. We've got passage tombs, portal tombs, wedge tombs and court cairns. So there's plenty. If you like tombs, it's a place to be. Um, and while there's still a lot of mystery generally regarding monuments and their functions, what we do know is that these types of monuments, all of these uh, different monuments were all very closely associated, quite literally, they were quite geographically closely associated, which is something we're going to touch on tonight, this idea of sort of sacred or monumental landscapes. Um, usually they were built near to each other, sometimes even on top of each other as well, as they returned in later years. Whether this was a deliberate thing due to some deeper symbolism or simply down to the builders sort of making good use of a particular location. I don't think anyone's entirely sure. Um, that's the thing with prehistory. A lot of it is guesswork. Um, but what we do know and what we'll explore tonight is that it's not an uncommon thing. Um, but I won't go into it too much. I won't take away from my other speakers. Um, in the later Neolithic, we start to see different kinds of monuments emerge. Around 2900 BC to 2200 BC, we start to see henges emerge. So henges comprise of a, a bank, a ring shaped bank with a ditch running around the inside of that bank. And inside henges, there are sometimes features like timber or stone circles or pits or burials. Um, whether they were created before or after the henge monument itself varies depending on the site. Um, but they can be found in there. Um, stone and timber circles did also exist separately from henges, so Stonehenge, um, which began being built in the Neolithic, but actually apparently took so long to finish that archaeologists believe it was finished in the Bronze Age, so it stretched over quite a span of time. Um, later in history, we start to see hill forts emerge, which I'm sure Kim will touch on a little bit with promontory forts and hill forts. Uh, in Ireland, some of these hill forts predate those of Great Britain, so some of the hill forts in Ireland go all the way back to the Neolithic and Bronze Age. In Great Britain, they were mainly constructed in the Iron Age onwards with a few Bronze Age examples. Initially, it was agreed that hill forts were built for defensive purposes, but now there's a bit of debate. Some people think that they might have served ceremonial or ritual functions instead. So we're seeing that theme again, where no one's entirely sure what's happening. Um, and that's what archaeology is here for. It's trying to work out what was going on when there was no written documents to help us work it out. So without further ado, that is my very, very quick whistle stop tour into prehistory. So what I'm going to do now, I will stop sharing my screen. And what I'm going to do is pass on to our first speaker of the night. So what we're going to do going forward is we're going to discuss three sort of case studies of three different monument types, what we know about them, what there is to learn and where they sit in the wider landscape. Because like I mentioned, they're not often isolated. They do have other sort of monuments attached to or associated with them. So we're going to start off with Paul, who's going to take us through Long Meg and the Eden Valley. Um, so I'll just put Paul front and centre and you can take it away. Thank you very much, Paul. I like the way you say prehistory is all about guesswork. That's why it's so much more interesting than Roman rubbish. <clears throat> I'm sure everybody will agree. Um, I'm going to talk to you for the next, is it 15 minutes? I think it's 15 minutes. Yeah, 15. Um, about one of my favourite places, Long Meg and Her Daughters. Um, I'll try and cover a number of key themes and some recent field work. 
and um, I hope you find it interesting. And I hope um, I've no notes, I've just pictures. So I'm hoping that my post COVID brain can remember what to say about them. Right, Long Megan Her Daughters at the heart of Neolithic Britain. Well, different. Is that all right? Can you see a stone in a map now? We can, yeah. <laughs> if I go out of uh, sync with the pictures, um, Jenny, can you just tell me, please, because something will have gone wrong. OK, right. Not a good start. Anyway, Long Meg at the heart of Neolithic Britain. There's my favourite stone in the world. Long Meg, giant great big lump of um, red sandstone. Uh, and on the map, on the right hand side, you can see a red star which shows you where it is. So you can see it is actually at or very close to the centre not only of Neolithic Britain, but of all of Britain, Britain of all periods. Um, it's often referred to as Northern because we talk about the North and people think of Cumbria and Northumberland as the North, but of course it isn't, it's Central. And that I think is important to realise when we try and think about why, um, why Long Meg is there. Um, it's partly to do with, uh, well, it, everything is to do with its location. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having to close things down here while I'm going. Um, part, it's all to do with, with location. Um, you can see the map there, for those of you that aren't familiar with um, this part of uh, Northwest England, um, the things to notice are the motorway and the A road going up over the North Pennines, because the um, the location of Long Meg, uh, close to the River Eden there, is um, defined by natural routes through the landscape. So uh, you can see the two images at the top, one looking to, um, eastwards towards the North Pennines, one looking over the site, over the Eden towards the Lake District. And uh, as I hopefully will demonstrate to you, those are crucial, um, regard, uh, the, are crucial to it, its location because you can go there and you can think, hang on, I certainly did the first time I went there, why is this here? Never mind what it is, but why here? So we'll try and answer that. Um, Aubrey Burl, for a long time, kind of main authority on stone circles. He explains how long we so much bigger than the other Cumbrian stone circles that you might know, like Castlebrick and, and the others. But just, I mean, don't worry about the figures, but it just is huge. It's on an altogether different scale and estimated that, you know, how many people it would take to move the stones, which is something we'll touch on shortly. And he said in 1994, on the basis of um, very little evidence, that Long Meg may be one of Britain's oldest stone circles erected in the years before 3000 BC. And what you can see there, is the ring of the daughters and Long Meg in the photo to the right-hand side. And the two images on the right show Long Meg, this great big um, lump of red sandstone, and some of the daughters uh, behind. There are six, eight daughters, which is not really of any significance. That's just the number that are left because we know that some have been lost. I've written everything that I had to say about Long Meg pretty much um, last year in this book called New Light on the Neolithic of Northern England, which also has lots of other very interesting things in it. I'm not trying to I make no money out of it whatsoever, but if you're interested, that's the place to look to find out more information. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, I just put that picture in because I I never, whenever I try and talk about Long Meg, it always takes so much longer than it's meant to, whether it's a tour of the site or a lecture, it's in about 90 minutes. So this is a very cut down version. I'm going to talk about, uh, after this kind of general introduction, uh, fieldwork by Altogether Archaeology and Durham University in 2013 and 2015. And I'll briefly touch on work by um, Dig Ventures and Felfoot Ford, uh, which was done um, this year, but I'm not really gonna say very much about that at all partly because I missed half of it for COVID and partly because the post X is still underway. Um, oh my goodness. Oh, stop it. Go backwards. I apologize. It can go backwards. Oh, also, I'm not going to talk. I'm going to try very hard to which because when you look at Long Meg and you see a road going through the middle of it and you see the interpretation at the middle there at the top, which is uh, until recent, well, still is the only on-site interpretation, um, a rusty old panel that says nothing uh, and uh, the local signposts, which I hope they never change, saying Long Meg Druids Circle, which has nothing to do with Druids. Um, and of course, I could whinge about what happens at Stonehenge and places like that, but I'm going to try very hard not to. Um, and Long Meg is still a sacred place today. And if you go there almost certainly at any time, you'll find offerings that people have made at the foot of um, Long Meg herself and maybe ribbons tied in the trees. And um, 
there, there's always a curious assortment of things there. I think in that picture you can see mushrooms, carved stones, uh, hair bands popular that day, candles. Um, there's there's often fruit and occasionally coins and other things. But it's still a sacred place for some people today, and I get that. I get that completely. And I see Long Meg in two different ways. I see it at one level as a very sacred place, a very spiritual place um, that basically just makes me happy. And at the same time, I see it as a fantastic archaeological puzzle. Um, it's as an archaeological puzzle that I'll be talking to you mainly about it tonight. It's been known since the 17th century. It always been called Long Meg and uh, her daughters from that time. It's an interesting name. Um, the first accurate drawing was by Stukeley in 1725. And he shows, as you'll see there, a lost stone circle towards the top left, which is... Um, I suspect it is destroyed and lost, but it might just be a little bit of it left. Uh, and um, he recorded that some of the stones were being destroyed at that time. And then at the bottom, another plan from a little bit later by someone called George Smith with a lovely 18th century quote, the way people used to write, Long Meg and her daughters, about which it must be acknowledged that all conjectures are extremely uncertain. I think that's another way of saying it's all guesswork. But um, anyway, but he also made the observation, which is very important, that nowhere in the surrounding landscape were there any boulders like Longwake's daughters, which leads to the question, did they really find every one for miles around and drag it there, or did they come from somewhere else? And that's something we'll come on to. Stukeley's drawing is astonishingly accurate in the part nearest to, to you as you look at the screen. The edge, it gets a bit of guesswork. Um, when we did our, well, that's where we're doing our excavations, as you can see, um, we um, we put a drone up. Now, he didn't have a drone in 1725. He didn't have a camera. He didn't even have a, any way of getting up to that sort of height. So it's an astonishing piece of work. And we were amazed how accurate it was when um, when you look at that. But anyway, that's kind of a bit of a side. And um, Wordsworth went to visit and said that it doesn't bear comparison with Stonehenge. Well, no, it doesn't bear comparison with Stonehenge. And I know which of the two I would prefer to spend time at, um, and, we, and you know, which um, which I very much prefer. But um, he wrote a poem about it, which is a splendid poem, but there's no time to read it out tonight. A weight of awe, not easy to be borne, fell suddenly upon my spirit, cast from the dread bosom of the unknown past, when first I saw that sisterhood forlorn. He clearly got it in terms of the um, specialness of the place. Still in the 19th century, in 1967, the carvings were first noted on Long Meg. Now, those are really interesting uh, for all sorts of reasons, not least because they're Irish. And this is a theme I think we might return to uh, a number of times tonight. Um, those, uh, those carvings really are, are an Irish type of carving. So what on earth are they doing on this site um, in, uh, in East Cumbria? Might come back to that. And then fundam a fundamental point, which again we'll refer, we, we will um, come back to. Um, George Watson, who was a local architect in 1900, he noticed that Long Meg is aligned on the winter solstice sunset. And, and this is this is crucial. These kind of alignments, um, they they work to, uh, if you like, link the everyday world with the cosmos. They you know every year the sun sets behind Long Meg at the, at the winter solstice. Um, and then if people say the right prayers and do the right things, it'll start moving back again until, hey, it will be springtime. Uh, and then it'll happen again and again and again every single year. So this, this link with the winter solstice in particular and other, uh, other solar events during the year, but um, especially the winter solstice, we know was important uh, in North America amongst native communities. Um, and indeed, it inspired me to write that little book there, um, Stonehenge to Santa Claus, because now, of course, we call the winter solstice Christmas. But it's the same thing. It's about traveling distances, meeting people you haven't seen for a long time, having fun, uh, eating and drinking lots and a little bit of religion thrown in or a lot of religion, depending on your view. But we still uh, celebrate at the winter solstice. So I think people were coming to Long Meg at that time. A number of surveys were done over the years and they all show this curious flattened arc at the north end of the circle and lots of time was spent trying to explain why that's the easiest thing to do in the world to make a circle you just put a peg in the ground and walk around it with a bit of string uh, but this isn't a circle and lots of people wondered 
why and as i say all sorts of um strange ideas were put forward and then in the 1980s this amazing discovery was made and this is this serves to remind you when you go and look at a stone circle don't assume that the stone circle is necessarily all there is it's certainly not the case here because this huge great big earthwork enclosure now plowed flat was showing up as a parch mark all the way around the farm and you can see the flattened edge of the stone circle um, is aligned with the southern edge of the of this um, enclosure so that is clearly why if the enclosure is earlier uh, that is why that edge of the stone circle is squashed it should be even better on this false color image uh, which I'll show you a couple of times more over the next few minutes because it's very important but you can see this this vast you could fit three stone circles pretty much inside it and the stone circle is enormous it's 112 meters across so um so it's a, it's a huge complex notice on this air photograph how the um i wonder if oh i've lost my cursors i can't show you but um towards the top left you've got those two outlying stones outside the stone circle and then you've got long meg beyond that and then where the at the uh, at the top where the stone circle links with the enclosure you've got an, one more stone outside um and a little gap in the um parch mark of the enclosure that's fairly significant for some stuff that i'll talk about soon and um on on that um on this image where the trees are growing right at the right hand edge there is a uh, a spring still even now it never dries up there's a big pond and the water flows into it um could that be significant for the location of the site yes i think it what could um could well be because this is a lidar image on the left and what i've done there is i've taken the red image that you just saw i've turned it through 90 degrees so that north is at the top and you can see that where right on the edge where the trees are where the spring is you can see that that spring flows into this natural gully and the natural gully flows down through this very steep sided and quite dramatic valley which is now tree covered but the lidar by magic has stripped the trees away and then it goes down and joins the river eden so the site is linked to the eden it's linked to the eden um probably in a kind of um not just in a practical way but probably in a very um symbolic uh way as well because that water bubbles out of the ground people in the neolithic wouldn't have understood how why that happens but how it comes out of the ground down this gully into the river eden um and uh, on a sort of practical level as soon as you get to the eden um you got on your boat and you're away and i also think that long meg which you can see at the bottom there red sandstone almost certainly was quarried from the river cliffs uh at, at around about the point where that lives flows into the eden so you get on your boat and where can you go you can go wherever you want because uh the the, the link with all these places is by sea they simply show on there the location of long meg uh, the Eden flowing up to the Solway into the Irish Sea. You can go up to Orkney, across to Ireland, to Wales, to um, Brittany, or uh, to the east, across land, across the North Pennines. Crucial links to Yorkshire and uh, Durham and Northumberland. So it's not a back of beyond place. It's it's at um, it's at a fairly uh, what well, a place that was quite easy to get to. What about the daughters? I've said that Long Meg is red sandstone and was quarried from um, from close to the site. But what about these daughters? Some of them are absolutely huge. I know you can't really tell, but there's a scale. You can get an idea of the size of them. And uh, they're all what we call, or what geologists call, Borrowdale volcanics, which means they come from the central lake district. But how did they get here? And this is perhaps one of the most intriguing things about Long Meg. Um, it's generally assumed that they were dropped in the in the area by the glaciers and people gathered them together perhaps as they started to plow the land for the first time found these boulders and they they dragged them for whatever reason um to the site but um a geologist said to me a few weeks ago who claims to understand these things he said that is impossible there is no way the way that ice sheets went from the central lake district that those boulders 
could have been dropped where they are. And he also said they don't look as though they've been moved by ice. They should, they should be smoother and they should be broken up more. So if that is true, then, um, and it ties in with George Smith's observation that I made earlier that there aren't any similar stones lying around in the landscape, or there weren't in 1750. So if that's true, and we need more work before we can say it for certain, that means people dragged those stones from the central lake district. Um, to make the stone circle. Now, why would they do that? Good question. Well, we know people move stone. Everybody knows people move stones from South Wales to Stonehenge, don't they? But maybe something else, something similar is happening here. And there's an image you may not have been expecting to see um, from Nias in Indonesia from 1915. And I put it in there to make the point about moving stones. Um, the, the purpose of a place like Long Meg is about community. It's about people work coming together to build the, um, in this case, stone circle. And lots and lots of people would come together for these things. Probably people who lived most of their lives locally and also because of what I explained about the location and the accessibility, also from um, a long way away. And I suspect they were coming here at midwinter and that's probably when they were moving the stones. Um, but of course they could have been at other times too. And the other thing that it's really important to remember is this idea I've put process versus product, not competitive tendering. And the reason I put that is because the idea, the way things were done was so different to today. And when we look at a stone circle, we think somebody must have designed it. Oh, let's have a circle. Where should we get our stones from? Oh, we need um, 75 stones. Let's go and find them. No, um, it's about um, the, the, the value is in the process. It's in the building of it. So whereas today, if you want a supermarket or a, um, football stadium or even a church you get an architect the architect draws the plans then you get your builders in and your subcontractors and you go through a process of building and then you've got what you want to use i'm convinced that places like long meg it is the process it is the building that is the most important thing and i'm not saying that the site is is not important it is once it's there but we have to remember it's a very different process to building something today so very quickly through this work that we've we've done in recent years, um, this work was done by a group called the Altogether Archaeology Group, working with Durham University, and you can get the reports from their website. Uh, just Google Altogether Archaeology um, if you really want to see uh, the results. And um, we did a survey, which I'm not going to talk about because I doubt you can see it very clearly on the screen. Um, but very detailed survey and geophysics, but the geophysics is not easy to interpret. So we're just going to say we did it. Uh, it's interesting, but I've no time to talk about it now. In terms of survey, very often you can uh, you can find out new things about these sites just by looking. For example, nobody had noticed on the right hand side this great big lump of quartz on the stone nearest to Long Meg. And I think um, that would have been on the top of the stone when it was standing upright. And also there, it's not very clear on the left-hand picture. There's one side of Long Meg that is completely covered in a sheet of quartz. And um, I haven't got time to talk about that uh, in any detail at all now, but I think that was um, very significant. And, uh, and I think again, quartz will feature before we finish tonight. So we have three little trenches, three really little trenches in this, in, in, you know, in this enormous site. And I realize you probably won't be able to see that they're, they're shown on the, um, right hand uh, the, the plan of the site uh, where well, that's far too complicated to try and understand now so we won't worry about it because they'll all come up in the next few pictures trench three was over the um crop mark ditch a long way away from the stone circle and we found nothing except the section through the ditch but it was well worth digging because we've got a radiocarbon date from the bottom of the ditch uh, doing this i'm conscious i'm having to race through this so quickly um trench two was over the um what well, you can see on the left hand side there the the area where the stone circle lay immediately adjacent to the great um enclosure ditch and the top image shows that well we were actually able to demonstrate that the stones had originally been set in the backfill ditch so we could tell that the enclosure was older um, than the stone circle, but we couldn't tell by how much. 
and also that um, the reason all those stones had fallen is because they were in, built actually physically in the backfield ditch. So there's some relationship between the enclosure and the stone circle, but we can't be sure what. Um, there were various features of interest like that um, curious hole um, bashed into one of the stones that you can see in the middle picture. And at the bottom, you can see the packing stones where the, stone, where the, the big stone has slipped and that point was in the ground. There's also a cut mark on the bottom of the stone, which must have been, would have been buried when the, when it was there. So that um, you can you can start asking questions about cut marks. Oh, and fines. Uh, these weren't all from Trench too, but just just uh, had to drop this in somewhere. The fines, Aaron Pitchstone, fragments of Langdale axes from the Central Lake District, and Yorkshire flint. There's no flint on that, but Yorkshire flint. So that ties in with what I was telling you about the location of the site again. Aaron Pitchstone from Aaron, obviously, um, stone from the Central Lake District and um, and Flint from Yorkshire. We didn't find that lovely axe in the middle. That's just to show you what, an, uh, <laughs> what a Cumbrian axe looked like. Um, but why were they smashing them? These are really valuable things, but um, they bring them to the site and they're smashing them for some reason. And I think all of these finds go with the enclosure, but they were all found from context where we can't be quite sure. So. Um, we haven't actually got any finds that we can say were definitely associated with the stone circle rather than the enclosure. Oh, I'm just going to um, have to butt in for a second. We might just have to wrap up now if that's all right. Can I can I have two more minutes? Yeah. Sorry, I should be timing it, but I wasn't. <laughs> right. trench, one, trench one was the interesting one. Um, you can see in the top right that um, the, there's a missing stone. There should be another stone there on that so-called entrance, and it's not there. So we excavated it, and sure enough, we found on the bottom left the um, socket stone for it. Uh, various other features as well, but the socket stone was the crucial thing. And out of that came dates. Everybody's interested in dates. Look at the second date on that column, which is the stone socket. And the date is 4475 in radiocarbon years, which is approximately 3200 BC. Uh, uh, 3200 BC, there's only one other. The other dates, obviously, I haven't got time to talk about. There's only, but the enclosure is about 3,900 BC, so it's a lot older than the stone circle. And then um, the missing socket, 4475, there's only one other dated stone circle in uh, Cumbrian stone circle, which is just north of Cumbria in Scotland, and it's Loch Mabin, where a big stone, the only surviving stone of that fell over. And uh, they did the same as us and got charcoal out of the uh, socket stone and dated it. Um, look at that, 4475, the radiocarbon year date is exactly the same. So is that coincidence or is that when people were building stone circles? I suspect it's when people were building stone circles. And then just finally, because I said that I would include this, um, recent work by um, Dig Ventures, another stone circle, Grey Yards, which is about um, 12 kilometres north of Long Meg, because uh, there are lots of other sites in the area. This had 88 stones. Uh, it was 50 meters in diameter, so not as big as Long Meg, but still a, a huge monument. Um, now just a single stone, everything else has gone, but some really interesting geophysics, and I know you can't see the detail on that, but the suggestion there is that um, there are actually stone sockets uh, surviving from when the other stones were all smashed up to build the field wall. So there's more field work there that needs to be done. Um, and it's potentially very exciting, it's a really important piece of geophysics um, done by the Adventures on the Falfoot Ford project. I said two minutes, that's the end. Um, I hope you found that interesting. I'm sorry for rushing through it. I said it normally takes me 90 minutes, um, but uh, uh, I hope you found it interesting. Um, clearly, there's lots more important and exciting work still to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. That really was so fascinating. I'm sorry to have cut you short. At the it's end. all right. We can absolutely come back to it later though, not to worry guys, but we've got so much prehistory to go through. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna hand over to John Ski, who's going to tell us all about Bruna Boyne in Ireland. So John Ski, if you'd like to take it away. Thanks Ginny, nice one. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great, I'm gonna share my screen and that should be there. Can you see that? My first slide. Yep, that's good. Brilliant. Okay, right. I'm just going to jump straight in. So, um, Bruna Boyne Monumental Landscape. Where is Bruna Boyne? Um, at a bend in the River Boyne, County Meath, in the Republic of Ireland, lies a spectacular World Heritage Site. 
uh, most no notably dominated by uh, the three largest, most impressive and highly decorated developed passage tombs in the country. Um, a quarter of all the Neolithic art that's currently known in Western Europe has been uncovered within and around the Brunaboyne megalithic monuments. Um, excavations between the 17th and the 20th century explored the tumuli that were visible above ground, culminating in the 1960s with the beginnings of modern archaeological investigation by Professor George Ogan at Townley Hall and Nouth and by Professor M.J. O'Kelly at Newgrange. Uh, recently, um, continued research and study across the gravel ridges on which the monuments were built has brought to light information on dozens of other sites, enclosing and neighbouring the giant passage tombs of Nouth, Newgrange and Douth. Uh, with many appearing to celebrate them or enhance their impact within the landscape. Um, these other monuments include henges, enclosures, palisades, a ritual pond, a ceremonial processional route or cursus, um, standing stones, enigmatic structures and smaller tombs, altogether creating a sprawling cemetery uh, landscape of unparalleled scope and scale. Um, these most newly identified features in the landscape were not typically identified by digging holes, but rather by sustained study using aerial photography, satellite imagery, analysis of LIDAR data, and large-scale geomagnetic surveys. Um, sustained effort and expertise by a variety of dedicated groups and individuals, including Dr. Steve Davis of UCD, have expanded our knowledge of what lies beneath the ground at Bruna, Bruna Point, sorry, giving tantalizing clues as to what occurred here in the distant past. Um, the drought in Ireland in 2018 brought to light spectacular new features of Bruna Boyne, um, revealed as parch marks on the ground to be recorded by drones, aerial photography and satellite imagery. Um, some of these timber and earthwork features rival the passage tombs themselves in terms of scale and effort to resource and build. Uh, we know relatively little about their character and form yet, although work is always ongoing. Um, I'm not going into much detail on these slides, they're kind of more tantalizing, but just the, I don't know if you can see in the one that's the, the kind of bottom one on the left, the, the palisaded enclosure there, it's certainly projected and appears to go all the way around Newgrange, and there's three rows of, of timber post holes, uh, just thousands of trees, and the likelihood is that they would have been joined together by planks, so the actual, similar to what um, uh, Paul was saying earlier, you, know, you have this focus in the middle of the landscape of a huge monument, but all around it, it's this peripheral landscape of, of stuff. And it's, it, you know, it's really quite fascinating. And this is all incredibly um, fresh, you know, just within the last 10 years that this is, is or, well, there's a lot of henges that were known, but basically this, you know, is a, a huge amount of, of new stuff that's, um, that's coming out. And just catch where I am here. Um, So um, the main construction period of Bruna Boyne's megalithic monuments dates from around 3,300 BC. Uh, so this is older than the Giza pyramids in Egypt, which would be 2,600, and Stonehenge in England, which would be 2,200. From radiocarbon dates, it's believed the construction phase of these developed passage tombs at um, Bruna Boyne was limited to a period of about 300 years, although they were in use for much longer. Um, the transition within Ireland from small populations of typically coastal Mesolithic nomadic hunter-gatherers to larger settlements of Neolithic early farmers created the conditions for stability, prosperity and organisation that made the construction of monumental projects possible. Um, sustaining and motivating a workforce of potentially hundreds of people for years and years on a, a collective project um, requires huge resources and significant power, not to mention um, epic determination and motivation. Uh, the land at Bruna Boyne is low-lying and slopes towards the river uh, to the south. Um, it's fertile and suitable for farming and has direct access to the River Boyne and onward to the sea at Drogheda. Um, at a time when waterways were a conduit to travel rather than a barrier, the river was likely used as a transportation aid in the construction of Bruna Boyne passage tombs. Uh, we know that um, the stones used in the construction came from diverse and distant sources up and down the east coast of Ireland, adding another layer of mystery and awe to their origins. Um, white quartz came from the Wicklow Mountains, 80 kilometres to the south. Uh, curbstones came from Clotherhead to the north. Uh, siltstone cobbles, gabbro and granite, granite cobbles came from 50 kilometres north in the Carlingford and Morn region. And grano, granodiorite from Sleeve Coog, which is 70 kilometres away in Northern Ireland. 
Uh, these locations also have their own megalithic monuments, um, particularly the Wicklow Mountains and Carlingford. So there are layers upon layers of interaction and communication between the wider Neolithic pop, uh, populations of the Irish East Coast. Um, who built the structures at Bruna Boyne? Um, this is a, a, not a brilliant map, but it, it was um, the best I could steal from the internet. Um, so we don't know a great deal about who built them. Um, the cemetery at Newgrange, but there are clues around the Atlantic coastline from other monuments that may have inspired Newgrange, Nath and Douth, or had a shared ancestry of origin. Um, based upon similarities in the structural design of the tombs themselves and the stylistic contents of the Neolithic art which decorates them, we can see parallels and similarities to monuments from as far afield as southern Spain, Brittany and Denmark, with other examples closer to home uh, in the north of Scotland, Wales, England, as we heard from Paul, and Northern Ireland. Um, Passage tombs that fall into two basic structural styles within Ireland. Uh, you get undifferenti undifferentiated and cruciform, uh, with the former comprising a linear passage that widens slightly into a chamber, and cruciform tombs having a, a distinct and complex chamber with three recesses leading from it. Uh, the mound at Nath could be considered unusual because it actually contains an example of both types of chamber within the one monument. Uh, you can see on the, the drawing there, the Western passage is undifferentiated and the Eastern is cruciform. Um, uh, Ginny mentioned these styles earlier, but um, uh, both types of passage tomb have general consistencies that are uniform to them um, and differ from other types of smaller Neolithic burial monuments like court tombs, portal tombs, wedge tombs and dolmens. Uh, and it's worth noting that these smaller tomb types have been fitted into these classifications by archaeologists um, rather than them necessarily being built like a template or anything in the Neolithic and Bronze Age. You know, they're, they're stylistically, they do kind of fall into four quite distinct structural types, um, which you can see there. Um, and passage tombs are usually built intricately using huge boulders. Um, they've got elaborately corbelled and lintled roof structures. Uh, the megaliths are subsequently covered in a mound of rocks and earth uh, with a monumental curb that retains the earthwork. They're often found in coastal locations or in proximity to the sea. Uh, they're usually sites of communal burial and they contain artifacts that were left as grave goods with the dead. Um, they're often decorated on their structural surfaces. Uh, burials associated with them are typically cremated um, and the bones that are um, found in them are suggestive of selective incarnation process. So not all the bones of each individual appear to have been chosen to be entombed. Um, and also presumably not all the individuals from the society that built them were buried within the tombs. So there's, there's some kind of hierarchical process or you know, there's, a, there's a selection. Um, Artistic styles of both carving technique and form at Bruna Boyne display tantalizing similarities and curious differences to parallel foreign examples. Um, the spiral form seen at Newgrange is almost unique to Irish Neolithic art, although similar styles do, uh, stylistic examples have been found in Orkney and England, as Paul was showing at Longmeg. Um, uh, but other patterns of lozenges, which are the kind of diamond ones that you can see in the, the bottom second in from the left at the bottom there. Um, and geometric shapes are typical of Iberian tombs, um, while one of the decorated orthostats um, with curvilinear art at Nauth has a distinct parallel with the carving in Brittany. Um, Bruna Boyne appears to have witnessed the development of a kind of homegrown art style with strong influences from continental peers or forebears, which might be owed either to a shared origin or interconnected trade and cultural exchange. Um, as we've already seen from Paul, there are many more similarities between British Isles monuments either side of the Celtic Sea than with Spanish and Britannic examples. Um, another interesting feature of the three largest passage tomb mounds at Bruna Boyne is they all contain very large decorated sculptural stone basins within their main chambers. Uh, the basins contained the remains of the dead and they were obviously really important to, um, to the guys building it, uh, well, the people building it. Um, now, I'll just go into a bit more detail about the actual Nauth, Douth, Newgrange passage tombs, just to give you a sort of overview of them. Um, the three largest passage tombs seem to have been cited to exploit the highest points of ground within the landscape of Bruna Boyne. Um, they're interspersed with other contemporary and later features across the landscape. There's a total of 37 tombs between Nauth, Douth, Newgrange, the River Boyne, Ballincrad, Monk Newtown and Townley Hall. Um, there's no apparent pattern or strategy to the positioning of the smaller tombs, they're just kind of scattered around. Um, earlier domestic Neolithic settlement 
features have been found that are predating the tombs. Um, I think that was at Townley Hall, uh, George Ogan excavated those, and there was like a settlement underneath one of the mounds. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, sorry, given the, lands the, the landscape a time span that encompasses the known activities of humans on the landmass that's now Ireland since the, the last ice age retreated. Um, the passage tomb at Nauth, the complex there, is the furthest to the west. Uh, at Brunaboyne, and it consists of one large mound containing two passage tombs surrounded by 18 smaller round, mounds. Um, the largest of them is known as Site 1. Uh, the monument covers half a hectare and it's about 95 meters across at the widest point. Um, and around the entrances, there were sort of settings like cobbled surfaces of uh, quartz, granite, and um, banded stones. Um, and within, within the area of Nauth, there's 400 separate decorated stones it's just covered in them um, and that's the, the bottom left picture there is George Ogan um, who sadly died recently um, that was hidden uh, within the, the tomb at Nath which he added a huge amount of information to the, the corpus of Irish knowledge. Um, now Douth is the least well known of the three great tombs of Bruna Boyne. Uh, it lies closest toward the coast uh, it's at the eastern end of the cemetery complex it's the same size as Newgrange and Nuff, but it's not been excavated in recent times. Uh, and it's kind of overgrown looking when you see it these days. It's, it's um, I think you can just drive up to it. The others you have to go with by bus, but you can just come, go and visit um, Douth on its own. Uh, the mound is about 85 meters in diameter. It's estimated to have 115 curb stones, but only half of them are actually visible. And of the ones that are visible, 15 have um, art on them. Uh, the mound's quite high, it's about 15 metres tall, but a lot of that is where it's been quarried um, in sort of not even antiquity, like sort of uh, modern times, basically. And um, there was a kind of cavalier and fruitless attempt to find a, a, a central chamber um, excavated into it in 1847. And you can see that the chambers are actually off to, to one side. <clears throat> Uh, Newgrange is the best known Irish passage tomb. Uh, it dates to 3200 BC. The large mound is approximately 80 metres in diameter and it's surrounded at its base by a curb of 97 stones. The um, most impressive of these stones is the highly decorated entrance stone, which is visible in the, the top right slide there. Uh, the appearance of Newgrange today with its facade of white quartz stone is not actually consistent with how it would have looked in antiquity. The stones were found where they were, um, where they've been rebuilt, but it's more likely they actually formed a cobbled surface on the ground rather than a, a vertical structure. Um, similar surfaces, as I said before, were observed when they were excavating at um, at Nauth. Uh, the mound covers a single um, single tomb. It's got nine. Uh, it's a nineteen meter long passage. Nineteen, sorry, um, with a cross shaped chamber um, and corbelled roof. The builders overlapped large layers of ro large rocks until the roof could be sealed with a single capstone, and um, that's six meters above the above the ground. You can see a view there in the bottom, kind of looking up at it from the ground. Um, and it, yeah, six meters high. Um, the passage faces toward the southeast, and possibly its most significant feature is a precise alignment to the rising sun on the winter solstice. Um, the dawn of the shortest day of the year. An ingenious design above the doorway permits a shaft of sunlight to pass up the passage to the chamber at dawn on, on the winter solstice. And fascinatingly, this effect it was only witnessed and recorded for the first time in modern times in 1967. Uh, various locals that were visiting the excavations had described to Professor M.J. O'Kelly and his colleagues that there was a kind of belief or legend or oral tradition that the sun did sometimes shine into the chamber, but excuse me, no one knew exactly when and um, no one that was alive had ever seemingly seen it. It was just this sort of myth almost that the, the, the sun shone into the chamber sometimes. Um, so based on the, the analysis of it, they were there in 1967 on the solstice and sure enough, it, it came in. Um, the transit of the sun illuminate, illuminates the chamber for 17 minutes, weather permitting. It, it's kind of rare enough that it actually goes in there, but um, the events live streamed each year by the Office of Public Works. I've, I've put the link on there, but um, I didn't actually pass it to Ginny, so we'll share that sort of properly, but uh, yeah, you can kind of tune in. They do it for about a week either side, just depending on, because the, the, a, a longer period of time that it does work, but it's just the solstice is the kind of best one. Um, basins on the floor of the recesses, I mentioned a minute ago, um, found the remains of five people within them, um, although it's likely there would have probably been more bone placed there in the past. Um, 
Most of the bones found were cremated, although there were some small amounts that were unburned. And there were grave goods of chalk and bone beads and pendants and some polished stone balls. Um, the interior surfaces and stones in Newgrange are richly decorated with abstract artwork engraved and sized and picked out on the megaliths. Uh, there's also evidence of earlier pre-worked monumental megaliths being recycled or reused within the corbel roof of Nowth. Um, so it suggests that earlier monuments were maybe being deconstructed and rebuilt, uh, which raises other fascinating questions about what sort of processes were going on on the, the landscape. Um, so uh, in terms of why, why did people build megalithic monuments? Um, we don't know. Um, we can't know. <laughs> we we, um, we don't really know who built the tombs at Bruna Boyne uh, or what they were thinking about, what they believed. And we can't really confidently interpret their art either. Um, we can ask questions and do what we can to answer them with the tools and the resources and the technology that we have at our disposal. Um, the purpose of the megalithic monuments at Bruna Boyne appears principally to be the honour to honour or house the dead. Um, Dr Elizabeth Sheetuig, who's one of Ireland's most respected experts on megalithic art, has queried, you know, whether the tombs are containers of the dead or whether they're place markers or, or simply special places. Um, you know, was part of the process of building these structures to demonstrate power over the land or materials or people. Or did they build them because they had the power to do so? You know, what, what was their kind of reasoning? Um, there's evidence of uh, prehistoric use of sea caves as, as um, early tombs. Uh, this sculptures cave near Lossiemouth in Scotland is a particular example with its kind of Bronze Age remains there, but um, selectively interred bones and evidence of what we'd consider pretty unusual rituals of excarnation and funerary display. So, you know, perhaps coastal dwelling Mesolithic people saw an opportunity to recreate natural ancestral tombs while clearing the land of trees and stones to develop and expand their early farms. Um, the sun and seasons were clearly well known and deeply important to the megalithic monument builders. Um, this is also often conceptually linked to their role as early farmers with seasons being particularly important for planting and harvesting crops. But it's also undeniable that um, the annual movement of the sun and stars would be of equal importance or possibly even greater to hunter gatherers who depend completely on the cycles of year round flora and fauna to um, sustain their diet and their well being. So the megalithic tombs and landscape constructions could realistically represent a solidification of earlier held beliefs and knowledge that previously had to be marked in a more ephemeral way and didn't survive the passage of time so tangibly. Um, in terms of what's next, certainly for, for Newgrange um, and uh, the Bruna Boyne landscape, um, the main questions that persist around um, Bruna Boyne and the wider study of the megalithic landscapes are pretty fundamental. Uh, these views are just of um, like the top left one there is the uh, interpreted results of the um, latest geophysical survey. The, the white features are basically unexcavated uh, new sites and, and uh, features in the landscape that have been found through the LIDAR and the, the geophysics and um, various henge monuments and other bits and pieces. There's a sort of a post alignment there that seems to be lined up with the Douth henge. Um, so, yeah, what 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 do we do? Like, um, oh no, the question, sorry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we don't know where the monument builders lived. Um, Newgrange alone is calculated to have required a workforce of 400 people for up to six months. Where were they living? Um, construction in the landscape spanned hundreds of years. So far, we've only found a handful of houses. Um, what are the specific dates and chronologies for all the other features within Bruna Boyne landscape? Um, were they all built, built in one big burst or was this construction sustained over the full span of activity that we can see from C14 dates? Um, what other uh, order did the different monuments get built? Um, and what could this order, if we did know, what would it tell us about the way the concepts and creativity developed in the Neolithic? Uh, and we don't know what happened in the Bronze Age. Um, people were clearly nearby Bruna Boyne, but appear to have left it alone for a while. I had to cut out a, a big chapter, or not chapter, but like a big segment about the kind of history, and it kind of goes into how in the Bronze Age, they kind of just, no one was doing anything at Bruna Boyne. It was just like really quiet. We know they were nearby, but it's like they kind of went away. Um, and yeah, what happened to the people that built and, and developed Bruna Boyne to see it go out of use for nearly two and a half thousand years? Basically, kind of people in the Iron Age started kind of doing stuff there, but there was a long, long period where it was just not much happening. So um, yeah, how do we answer these questions? Um, uh, the best option is targeting excavations to ground truth geophysics results and, and features and identified from aerial survey, try to recover datable samples and artifacts to build chronologies. 
um, more geophysics and remote sensing in previously unsurveyed areas to look for, for settlement activity. And um, yeah, study and comparison of all the available data and information to place megalithic monuments in their wider context internationally. Um, and I've got some thanks, but uh, yeah, thanks to Steve Davis for from the University of Col University College Dublin for giving images and information to help uh, prepare and illustrate the talk, and also um, Dr. Elizabeth Sheetug who gave some valuable assistance and advice in preparing. And thanks to everyone I stole images from off the internet. <laughs> Seriously. Fantastic. Thank you very much, John Ski. That was really interesting. Again, another fantastic presentation. Everyone seems like they've really enjoyed that. And we've got some good discussion going on in the chat. Oh, cool. um, which is amazing. Uh, if anyone has any questions for John Ski, don't forget to drop them in the QA. There's lots of questions for Paul as well for later. So we'll come back to those. But before we do, it's time for our final talk, who's going to be Kimberly, who's going to tell us all about Carvai and the Promontory Fort and the surrounding landscape as well. So, Kim, do you want to take over? Super. Um, I'll try not to witter on for too long. Um, so hopefully this is the screen. Can you see my slides? Yep. Yeah. OK, super. Let me just... Okay, so um, in my section, I'm going to take you through the next case study, which is Caravai Camp or Promontory Fort, situated in St. David's in the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park. It's a stunning location with incredible remains, um, and I can't wait to share our recent results with you. We'll then look at the wider Pembrokeshire landscape and why the term Promontory Fort or Hill Fort actually covers a broad range of different elements. So, um, Caravai Camp is one of 12 forts in Pembrokeshire that sits along the St David's Peninsula, and over half of the 106 coastal promontory forts known in Wales are located on the cliffs of the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park, so that's like 58 promontory forts alone. In fact, Pembrokeshire is actually littered with prehistoric monuments. They are the most abundant and diverse type of monument in Wales, but very little is known about their function and their role in prehistory. Climate change and an increase in coastal erosion has intensified the need to understand these impressive monuments before they're lost forever. So we will start by focusing on Caravai Camp, which we've been investigating for the past two years, and we'll see if we can understand what defines a promontory fort and were they actually forts at all. So Caravai Camp, or Penpladiae, as it's known locally, is a scheduled monument consisting of the remains of a promontory hill fort, nestled behind four what are coined as defensive rampart ditches, which were thought to have been constructed in four phases. The camp is located to the southeast of St David's in Pembrokeshire and is accessible, accessible directly by the coastal path. The fort had been surveyed and mapped, but had never been excavated until 2021, so very little was known about it. But a combination of new geophysical survey and excavations have started to reveal the secrets that this incredible camp holds. Dick Ventures have been lucky enough to secure a scheduled monument consent for the past two years in order to investigate this incredible fort. The first year of our dig formed part of a six year project between Ireland and Wales called the Cherish Project. And I know that some people in the audience um, have been a part of this with us. Cherish aims to raise awareness and understanding of the past, present and near future impacts of climate change on the cultural heritage of our sea and coast. As you can see in this photo, coastal erosion is destroying the narrow isthmus that the promontory fort is situated on. So time is running out to excavate and understand these remains before they're lost forever. This photo shows the scale of the erosion pretty well. Um, it won't be long before that narrow spit and the sea caves underneath the headland there collapse through and the remains of the fort are lost to the sea forever. During our two seasons at the camp so far, we've excavated on the narrow isthmus where the camp was thought to be situated, as well as on the defensive ramparts to the north and on the headland. So I'll take you through some of our key findings, but each of the 12 hill forts along the coastline are unique and it's up to archaeologists to work out why and um, try and figure out what was going on. There's also a super 3D model of this that the Cherish team made. If anyone's interested, um, we can pop a little link in the chat. So first up, the Rampart Trench. Uh, one of our trenches at the camp was located over one of the four massive defensive earthen ramparts to the north of the fort. Excavations during 2021 revealed a massive amount of erosion from animal burrows and bracken and revealed that the ramparts were actually quite unstable and heavily damaged. 
we didn't expect a high level of preservation, therefore, and the trench of 2021 was pretty sterile for finds. However, our excavations during 2022 revealed quite a surprise. Not only did we find evidence that the ramparts were covered in stone and would have looked just incredible from the sea, but it turns out that down towards the bottom of the trench, the ramparts were either stepped with stone right down to the foundations or were sat on top of a much older prehistoric building. Experts from the area hadn't seen anything like it before, so we got a micromorphologist in to take some environmental samples, see if we could try and find out some more about these incredible remains. Some large boulders were also discovered just in front of Maya there, which are thought to have tumbled down from a structure actually on top of the ramparts. In fact, there are still five huge stones still in place, which could have been a building or a wall or something really significant. We also think that these stone steps or foundations might go deeper. So if we can do it safely next year and step the trench, um, we might investigate this to see if the stepping is localised or see if they continue along the ramparts. So over in our main trench, um, two years of digging have revealed some super exciting results. We've discovered not one, but two built structures on this narrow eroding isthmus with plenty of occupational evidence to tell us about their use. The first structure was discovered in the south of the trench in 2021 and is illustrated by that yellow semicircle at the top of that image. We initially found a high concentration of organic burn material with lots of charcoal, cremated bone, eventually leading down onto an area of fat, um, flat laid stones forming what appeared to be a floor surface. This floor sat amongst a scattering of stone packed post holes, as well as finds comprising a Bronze Age thumbnail scraper. Iron Age pottery, some metalwork, copper and iron slag, which is the leftovers from metalworking, a spindle whirl, as well as stone tools such as hammer stones and whetstones. Further excavation in 2022 looked beneath these deposits and discovered a series of halves, so not just one, a massive half stone, a hammer stone, the bottom of a crucible and another spindle whirl. The crucible is um, the middle picture down at the bottom right. Um, so clearly a sustained period of of occupation had occurred in this building with evidence that suggestive of small scale workshop with loads of slag and charcoal along with the finds. The second structure was discovered underneath a huge rubble deposit and we didn't actually think anything was there until we lifted it just before the end of the dig. So whilst the southern structure appears to have been cut back into the natural geology and bedrock, this one appears to have been built using faced stone. Evidence within this um, structure comprised of charcoal, post holes, another hearth, and our first evidence for possible domestic activity comprising animal bones and shell. Um, so further investigation is planned here to try and get some dating evidence to see if this building is contemporary with the first roundhouse or if it's of a later more contemporary date. So all of this evidence points towards small scale localised industrial activity, but not towards settlement or defence, which is interesting that it's called a fort. Um, and here's a fun little photo of the students and staff where they stood in the locations of the two um, roundhouse structures and um, where the post holes are, just to give an illustration of what they could have looked like inside. So further on to the headland, um, some historical geophysical survey had been done years ago. So this is magnetometer data, um, but it had been affected by the strong geological bedrock. And so the results were really difficult to interpret. However, this year we undertook some earth resistance survey, and here's the data. And a quick interpretation on the right shows that we found evidence for a number of buildings um, beyond the eroding isthmus, actually out on the headland that's sticking out into the sea. We put a couple of test pits over some of the anomalies, like this one at the top, over that um, positive um, high resistance sausage shaped anomaly. And we found two thick stone walls, a post hole and a massive cache of wet stones, uh, one of which is in the photograph on the right. Um, the test pit is down in the bottom left hand corner um, of that image um, shown by the dashed lines. But we've only just nicked the corner of this possible structure, so there's definitely more to discover. It would be great to obtain some dating evidence, again, to see if these structures or this structure is contemporary with what's on the isthmus. Could it be another workshop? Looking at the aerial image, are we looking at a range of stone workshop buildings on this headland? And if so, where, where's the settlement? Where's the evidence for eating, living, keeping livestock? What is it that we're missing? 
Um, and this drone shot might give us some more clues. But we think the evidence lies further out on the headland itself. So if you look to the left of the big yellow arrow, we found a huge, thick, curving stone wall, which continued out into the vast chasm where the headland used to sit. We think a lot of the evidence for the fort has been lost to coast, coastal erosion. So the past surveys by Cherish have identified stone platforms and foundations in the cliffside, internet structures that have been lost to the sea. But if our geophysical survey is correct and um, we can ground through some of those features, there might be plenty more to discover on the headland that's still intact and hopefully we can find the answers before it's too late. So let's look at how Carefi Camp sits in the wider prehistoric landscape of Pembrokeshire. As I uh, mentioned earlier, Carefi is one of over 50 prehistoric promontory forts lining the Pembrokeshire coast path um, and uh, coast. And um, many of these sites would have been focal points in a really busy prehistoric landscape and would have once been extremely visible, both from the land and the sea. The density of the forts along the coastline suggests they were important components of the prehistoric landscape and seascape, but their functions are not clear. Some people argue they were focal points of trade, industry and settlement, and some people argue they were defensive, a very visible way of protecting and warding off seaborne intruders. Let's think about the location of these forts. They're situated along the dramatic cliff edge, looking out to sea. Some have huge earthen ramparts that can be seen for miles um, along the stretch of um, ocean or sea that's known as the Celtic Highway or the Celtic Sea Archipelago. So in prehistoric times, the sea would have been used as the main corridor of transport. And if you can picture it, this channel or highway would have been a super busy strait for boats passing up and down to Ireland, and Wales and beyond. The ramparts, I like to think of the ramparts and the forts have been um, akin to a modern day motorway services sign, um, an advertisement for trade, industry, food, drink and shelter. The ramparts at Carvai, for example, are huge and described as defensive, but the main entrance to the camp and the way up from the small harbour to the north is undefended. It doesn't scream defensive, really. It seems more like a symbol and a welcoming to passing seafarers. So let's quickly look at some um, other examples uh, before we start with the Q&A. So we've got a site called Partha Ra, which translates to Port of the Shovel or Or. This multi valet far is located to the west of Solva, to the east of St David's, on a pretty inconspicuous position on the coastline. The site comprises dramatic earthworks, producing a segmented enclosure with a series of terraces and low banks. Cherish estimates as much as three quarters of the original fort have been lost to coastal erosion, just leaving these two horns sticking out to the sea. Excavations have revealed a substantial Iron Age Romano British occupation, the remains of at least eight timber roundhouses, some of which have re been rebuilt several times in stone, along with fine Roman tableware amongst some of the finds. So the roundhouses and evidence for localised industrial activity is similar to Caravai, except Caravai has no evidence for Roman occupation at all, which is really strange. Um, there's also a super 3D model of this um, from the Cherish team as well. Um, Linny Head Camp lies along the Castle Martin coastline, which is chock a full of prehistoric remains. So again, we're defined by steep limestone cliffs and a series of defensive or um, ramparts to the north. Um, again, a lot has been lost to coastal erosion over the years. Um, a cross section of the main rampart and ditch has been exposed by erosion, revealing a rampart bank composed mainly of earth with a stony front. And again, we're given the image of huge ramparts covered in stone, which would have just looked incredible from the sea. There's also evidence for stone walls or structures actually on top of these ramparts, again, which bears a resemblance to what we're seeing at Caravai. Next up, we have Flimstone Bay Camp, which is arguably one of the most spectacular promontory forts in Pembrokeshire, again, on this Castle Martin coastline. It's nestled up again against a dramatic eroding land, uh, limestone headland. The camp is enclosed by a pair of ramparts as well as making use of natural escarpments. A huge chasm or cauldron sits dramatically within the centre of the camp. And adjacent to this, you can see scooped out hollows of Iron Age housing platforms. Can you actually imagine having your house next to this massive chasm? What would have been the reasoning and why did they do it? 
Finally, we have the fort and settlement at St David's Head, which translates as the soldier's bank, and this is a truly impressive fort. Within the fort itself, there are six stone-built roundhouses or hut circles, which are currently exposed and visible. You can wander around them, um, along with ramparts, as well as a plethora of Iron Age evidence, such as hearths, spindle whales, pottery and glass beads. It has, however, been noted that despite the impressive ramparts that are there, they would not have been useful in an attack given the fort's vulnerable position. So again, their usage comes into question, just like Caravai Camp. The artefacts lend weight to this being a coastal settlement with small scale industry, just like at Caravai, and not one of defence and settlement. So the area for habitation within the fort is really small, so it wouldn't have been a massive settlement, it maybe was a small camp. Recent research in Wales also suggests that the sites weren't necessarily suited for settlement and had been perhaps um, built to enclose natural coastal features, Given their location on a wet and wild Pembridge coastline, which many of you will be familiar with, would these have been occupied all year round or would they have been a transient? Would they have had an element of seasonality to them? So to wrap up, there's still a lot more research to be done about these incredible remains and time is really ticking with enhanced coastal erosion and climate change. But the more we discover, the more we seem to be stepping away from a violent and defensive theory for these uh, forts. Theories are leaning more towards pastoral, peaceful setting of transient settlement, industry and trade across this expansive and dramatic setting and beyond. And only further research will confirm these theories. Thank you very much, Kim. That's the last of our fantastic presentations tonight. Um, really, really fascinating. Like I said in the chat, I've dropped a link in there if anyone would like to join us at Caravai next year. You are, you are more than able to. Um, the crowdfunder is going live on the 1st of December. It's now open for subscribers for priority booking at the minute, but do keep an eye out because it's a really fantastic one. Um, so what we'll do now is we've got about 10 minutes. We'll do some Q&A. Uh, we'll answer some of the amazing questions that you guys have dropped in there. If anyone else has any, feel free to drop them in. I'll get through as many as I can in the next 10 minutes. For anyone who needs to disappear now, um, feel free, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'll be sending out the recording so you'll be able to catch up with anything that you miss um, and I'll drop all the links that everyone has mentioned throughout the night in there too and some further reading to get you guys going if you'd like to find out more. So let's see what questions shall I start with? There's so many. Um, I'll start with the Carvai questions and then we'll move back on up so we'll do it in sort of reverse chronological order. So we'll start with Mandy. Mandy has asked Kim if geologists have given any sort of time scope that it'll take for the Isma to um, be totally eroded in the first fault. It really depends um, if there's natural geological faults or weaknesses in the cliff edges. Um, for example, um, there was some mapping done in the 1800s of the Caribbean camp that shows the headland intact, you know, that big chasm that I showed with the drone footage, um, and that's gone in the last couple of hundred years. Since we were there last year, we also lost about three or four metres. So where we put our safety fence in last year, we had to step it back quite a bit. Um, so, I mean, the increase in storms, the increase in erosion, who knows? Um, yeah. Yeah, that answered. That yeah, that answered another one as well. Someone asked about um, how when did it start to erode? When did that collapse? So it was quite recent then. Yeah, I think so. And um, some of the evidence from the other promontory forts as well suggests that um, even though the forts are situated where they are, they could have actually uh, recent erosion. Erosion could have happened relatively recently after construction like the one that had the huge cauldron, was that there at the time of construction or did they have to leave that camp because that opened up um, soon after it? Yeah, we we have actually had, uh, there's one question about these people that were in this camp actually. Ian has asked um, whether the people using these forts, were they wealthy or were they using these as sort of working places? I think the evidence is leaning more towards working with the hearth, the metal slag, metal working, the spindle whirls. So it's hard to define wealth though. What, what we coin as wealthy now might not have been wealthy in the past. You might have been wealthy if you had a lot of land or a lot of family members. 
Um, but there's certainly similarities between all the ports with the spindle whirls and, and fines. Um, but as, as for any other kind of, the soils are really quite acidic in Wales. So we think we've lost quite a lot of evidence. Um, but yeah, oh, sorry, I went off track then, but I hope that kind of answered. It's, it's hard to define. Um, and a lot of them haven't been dug up and investigated. So we've just got like the surface remains for now until someone digs and has a look and get some answers about the people that live there, then um, that's a very good question. Yeah, we were actually talking about that. If anyone joined our presentation yesterday where we toured our dig at Rosina Vallis, which is just down the road from Carvai, we were talking about these poor soil conditions in Pembrokeshire and how they can affect archaeology there. Um, Ben's dropped a message in the chat as well. Ben from Carvai, who digs up the for a few years now, he was saying how surprised he was at how much had actually been lost this year compared to last year. So even now we can see that the pace of erosion is, is quite scary, really. Definitely um let's see um ellie asked if the ramparts and kevai could act um could have acted as sort of a route way for the cattle or for goods um anything like that quite possibly there was someone kept that came to site um that suggested that instead of walking down the main entrance way where we access site that maybe um visitors were forced to walk through the ramparts in kind kind of like a snake like processional um patterning which i thought was really interesting Mm, um, but it, yeah yeah but again it's down to our interpretation they didn't write anything down we just got to infer from the evidence and try and work out what was going on fantastic so we've got those two more questions about Kavai and then we've got quite a few I think Johnski's answered some already about Bruna Boyne by typing um, and then we'll move on to Long Meg so um, David was asking just in the chat now if, is there any insight in what the Neolithic coastline might have looked like are there any sort of reconstructions or any way for us to tell I'm not sure that it would have survived um, so I know that at some of the sites I mentioned they said there were timber roundhouses so they could have dated to the Neolithic and earlier um, but because there was this more organic building material, the only things that we're going to find for evidence are post holes. And if there's no finds in there, no organic material we can date, it's really hard to be able to tell if something is Iron Age, Bronze Age or Neolithic. Um, so certainly the research that I've done for the presentation hasn't pointed towards anything Neolithic, but that certainly doesn't say that they weren't there. It just means that we're not finding any, any remaining evidence to point towards them and our final question about Carvai is from Joanna who's asked that um, the fact that there's no evidence for the Roman occupation at Carvai does that suggest that it might have been defended potentially I mean in the first year we were there we found a lot of handheld projectiles which suggests that maybe they were um, defending it but the Romans were pretty messy. Um, they left a lot of rubbish, a lot of structures. Um, you know, we'd have at least expected to find a Roman site nearby. Um, if, you know, if they pitched up shop next to the fort with the intention of eventually taking it over, but there's nothing at all. So it could be that an, an Iron Age um, community was well established there and they just didn't bother with it. And that's why we've got this kind of... Um, no evidence for the Romans at all. Um, yeah, but maybe well. yeah. we've learned this field season. If you're going to find the Romans, you will find them. Oh yeah, <laughs> they want to be found everywhere. <laughs> yeah. If anyone saw at Linda's farm, we found some Samian this year, which <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Kim. So I think the rest of the questions um, are aimed for Paul at Long Meg. So I will start again. Uh, I'm going to start with Ben's question. So Ben has asked if the markings at Long Meg, Paul, are contemporary with the circle's construction or if it was added later. OK, <clears throat> sorry again for overrunning. It's very unprofessional. I have um, I'm one of those archaeologists who has no concept of time, but um, it's a good question. It's a very good question, and I can't answer it. Um, the we we don't know what the relative date of Long Meg herself to the daughters is. Never mind the date of the carvings on Long Meg. I have a theory, which I like, that those carvings were originally put on the river cliffs, 
and that Long Meg was carved with was was quarried with the carvings already on her and then dragged up to the site. Um, but the only way I've ever been able to prove that would be um, finding some other carvings on the river cliffs and they're so eroded and collapsed that I, I doubt anything would survive after 5,000 years and uh, or excavating the decorated face and seeing whether there are other carvings below ground which are a bit eroded but not as eroded as the ones that, that are exposed and that would suggest that the carvings were on the cliffs and eroded a bit before the stone was taken down but I don't think that's likely to happen um, in the very near future so uh, it's a good question and probably like most of them I have no very clear answer it's a common theme in prehistory, I think. <laughs> um, that's fantastic. You also answered another question in there. So that was great. Someone asked about the date of Long Meg relative to the daughters. Um, someone else has asked, um, oh, this is going on. How would they work out when the winter solstice was to align Long Meg and the circle? How do we think they would have done that? I guess with Newgrange as well. How would they have done these alignments? Well, I think if you if you give them a bit of time, I mean, if if we accept that Long Meg was a significant place long before the stone circle was built, which I think we've established by the date of the enclosure that was there first, then um, by putting posts in the ground and looking at shadows, you can work out when the sun is at its lowest place in, in the sky. Indeed, it's very interesting to go there on the day of the solstice if you can see the sunset, which hasn't been the case when I've been there recently, um, because the shadow from Long Meg is cast right over to the far side of the stone circle, which is a huge distance. Um, so I think they probably worked with um, with timbers, posts, and, and over a number of we wouldn't need a number of years, you could do it over one year, but it's possibly done over a period of time. You could just work out where the shadow is at its longest and then effectively um, that's the point, you know, as the sun goes down and then that, that that's effectively um, when the sun is at its lowest point in the sky. That's intriguing in itself because it shows sort of the amount of effort that's being put into constructing these monuments. I, I honestly think we can't overestimate the importance of the winter solstice in the Neolithic. It's not just Newgrange and um, Long Meg by any means. There's sites on Orkney. Stonehenge itself is allowed primarily on the winter solstice, I think. Uh, and there are there are many other examples as well. Mm. As, as I said, you know, we, we still do it today, but we call it Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see what else have we got. Um, oh, this is an interesting. Andrew's just built on that point. This has just come through now. Um, he asked, does that suggest that the circle size was determined by the shadow of Long Meg? Do you think that there's any link there? That's a really interesting question. I, I can't I can't say. Um, it does seem like a coincidence, doesn't it, that the shadow is cast right to the far side. Uh, but if you look at an air photograph, it really looks as though um, the stone circle has been squashed to squeeze in between the enclosure and Long Meg herself, which would suggest that Long Meg could have been there before, going back to the first question, before the stone circle. But you can actually devise a number of different sequences, taking everything into account, enclosure, stone circle, long meg, uh, <laughs> and the rock art on long meg, and you can make a convincing case for various different models. Awesome. So what time we want? I think I'll do, I might just do one more question. Sorry if we didn't get to any of your questions. Um, if you have any burning questions, do feel free to email them in and I'll pass them on to our speakers. We'd love to hear your thoughts and things. Um, I think I will finish up with Liz's question, Paul, who she has asked, um, what relationship do you think that Meg had with Mavra? Ah, well, that, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Again, um, Mabra is a, is a huge, it gets called a henge, but it's not really like a henge, huge, great, big um, circular monument build, um, built of, um, I say, thousands, must be hundreds of thousands, even millions of, of cobbles. Um, what would it be? 15 miles south of Long Meg, something like that. Um, and I think that Maybra and Long Meg and the now destroyed Shap Avenue in Cumbria are the three kind of mega monuments that, that did exist. Um, there are loads of other stone circles of all shapes and sizes, but um, whether that what the direct link was between Long Meg and Maybra, I, I, I couldn't say, except that they're two absolute key sites. So um, if uh, dig ventures are looking for another site to dig then i recommend maybra it'll be, <laughs> it'll be a big job 
Um, we do love I, I, we don't even that. actually know that we don't even actually know the date of Mabra, but I, I should imagine it is contemporary with Long Meg. Mm. Well, that's a we question. Well. Yeah. Fantastic. So I think that about wraps us up. Like I said, any sort of lingering questions, anything that anyone's desperate to know, absolutely do get in touch. Um, you've been a really fantastic audience. Thank you so much to our speakers. You've all been so knowledgeable. It's been really great to hear from you. Um, Long Meg was one of the first sites I visited as an archaeology student, so it's really nice to be able to do this event. Um, and I just love prehistory. I'm a big prehistory nerd, as I'm sure we all are here. So it's been fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you guys for your questions, for your comments in the chat. You've been really lovely. We've had such a nice community here tonight. Fantastic. Um, before we go, I'll share my screen one last time and I'll show you how you can keep getting involved. Here we go. So feel free to check out our website at digventures.com if you haven't before. We've got courses, we've got blogs, um, we've got all sorts on there, docu-series and uh, different videos that you can watch. We've got our past event archive for subscribers where all of our events like this live after the recording has expired. If you want to catch up on any that you might have missed in the past. We're also on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can follow us and we'll be posting there very regularly about what we're getting up to, where we're going next, anything like that. And of course, like I said, you can join us on a dig in 2023 including Carvai. So if any of you have been listening to this and fallen in love with that site, which it's very easy to do, it's so beautiful, uh, and you'd like to come along and dig it for yourself, um, our bookings will open for everyone on the 1st of December and they are currently open now for all subscribers. And we do have a new site which will be released soon, which is Archaeology in the Megalithic. So uh, we've got some more prehistory coming. No spoilers, no spoilers. You can see it on our calendar. Dates will be uh, released very, very soon in the next few months. So keep an eye out for that. Um, thank you again for coming. Like I said, I'll send out the recording email after this with all those links, everything that you need to sort of become a prehistoric archaeologist yourself. Um, and with that, I will leave you guys to your Thursday evenings. Um, I hope you have a lovely time and we'll see you for the next event. Bye everyone.